Okay, so this work resides in the context of probabilistic graphical models uh, and has a focus on approximate inference. And we're particularly uh, looking at the belief propagation algorithm and the beta approximation to approximate the marginal distribution and the partition function. The main question that we'd like to address is how is the accuracy between those two quantities related? So if, for example, we are given a solution or a fixed point which has a good approximation to the marginals, can we expect that this fixed point also gives us a good estimation of the partition function? And as it turns out, this is not always the case. And even worse, we can end up with uh, problems where belief propagation really converges to the global minimum of this beta approximation, but gives us suboptimal marginals. Okay, now let's make the model a bit more precise now. So we are considering binary pairwise models, which were already introduced in yesterday's tutorial, but I'll just like to give a brief definition here. So these models have binary random variables and are specified by some exponential potentials. And in particular, we have the local potentials and the pairwise potentials. So the local potential to specify which random variable favors which state, and the pairwise potentials, they kind of define their interactions between neighboring variables. So we've got this coupling strength, J, and whenever this coupling strength is negative, then two neighboring variables tend to be or push each other into the opposite state. And if these couplings are positive, they tend to favor the same state and remain there. So when all couplings in the whole graph are positive, we refer to it as an attractive model. And we'll only use attractive models because they have some very convenient properties that will then simplify our subsequent analysis. Okay, after we specified those models, we can just obtain the joint distribution as this product over all potentials times the normalization term. Now what we are looking at when doing inference is to compute those two quantities. So the first one are the marginals, which in a straightforward manner are obtained by just summing out all other variables except the one that we're interested in. And the second one is the partition function, which is just this normalization term. Now an important concept that we will use is the notion of the free energy, which is basically just a negative log partition function. Problem is, as the graphical model increases in complexity, those two uh, tasks become intractable. We just can't compute them in an exact manner in general. So we need to resort to some approximation methods. And we'll use the belief propagation and the beta approximation method here. And those two methods, they seem to be very different in their nature, but ultimately they end up optimizing the same objective. So I'd like to just give a brief sketch of the underlying concepts here, if you're not too fam familiar with it. Belief propagation is an iterative message passing uh, rule where messages are passed throughout the whole graph. And if it hopefully converges, we can then easily compute the marginals by taking the product over all incoming messages at a given node times the local potential. Now the beta free energy that really gives us an approximation to the free energy we have seen before by only considering a singleton and the pairwise marginals. And just as this free energy related to this partition function, the beta free energy relates to an approximation of the partition function, the so-called beta partition function. So that's what we try to optimize now. And it, as it turns out, those two concepts are related very closely as belief propagation fixed points constitute station, stationary points of the beta approximation. So whenever belief propagation converges, it does so towards a minimum of this beta free energy. If we're looking at a tree or a chain, then both concepts are exact and work very efficiently. However, if we're looking at loopy graphs, we only have approximate methods here. And in fact, 
as the coupling strength increases, this beta free energy tends to become non-convex, and consequently we have multiple solutions of varying accuracy. And what we want to do here is now we take a closer look at all those solutions and evaluate the error in the position function approximation, EZ, and the error in the marginals, EP, and then compare them. So I'd like to just jump into a first example, which is a very simple model, an attractive model, where all variables have the same local potentials. We call such a model homogeneous. And here in this uh, figure, we can see the exact free energy in black and the approximation using the beta free energy in blue. Now at both minima, we can obtain the partition function or the approximation, the beta partition function, and we can see the error here. And the minimizers are then the exact marginals for the free energy and the approximate marginals for this beta free energy. Now, as we increase the coupling strength, so in fact here we had a rather low coupling strength, we can see that this beta free energy becomes non-convex. And we have multiple fixed points now. Nice thing about attractive models now is, and that's actually the main reason why we focus on attractive models, is that it is guaranteed that the free energy actually lower bounds this beta free energy, which is not the case for general models. And this now gives us already a first uh, hint that the global minimum of this beta free energy is always optimal with respect to the partition function approximation. As we can show for these very simple models, the global minimum also gives us the best approximation to the marginals. So that's a nice thing here. However, the question remains, is this always the case and can we rely on this assumption? And it's normally, we have a problem when analyzing or trying to answer these questions because we either use very simplistic models like the homogeneous ones we have just seen, which are very well behaved and we can control them, but then they are not very rich in their properties. Or one usually looks at random models, also known as spin classes. And these models do have a very complex solution space but then we lose all this kind of intuition and they're really hard to control. So what we are looking at, or what we would like to have is some kind of middle ground here. Models that have more complex solution space as the one we have seen before, but they are still somewhat simple enough so that we can control them. And that's the reason why we introduce this so-called patch potential models, which essentially just stack such homogeneous models together, and every patch now has the same local potentials. The nice thing about these models is that we can define a somewhat well-behaved region that already has multiple fixed points, but we can still, at least to some degree, consider these patches or treat them independently, as we'll see in a minute. Now here, I'd like to take a look at the solution space again as we increase the coupling strength. So for very small values of the couplings, we again have one unique fixed point. And what we can see here is that the uh, uh, nodes are colored according to their marginals. So uh, here, all those marginals are aligned with the local potentials and everything is well behaved. As we increase this coupling strength, we end up with, at least for this specific example, three solutions that we can see here. And uh, in fact, we can show that inside this well-behaved region here, we always have relative few possible fixed points. They actually just depend on the number of patches and not on the number of variables, which is a nice thing. Uh, I'd like to go quickly through the construction or how we end up with those fixed points. Basically, we have seen for a homogeneous model that every patch for itself can take one of two possible solutions. And if we take this one here, where the lower patch has all variables aligned with the local potentials, then the upper patch can take one of those two possible fixed points. So these are those two solutions here, and it depends on the initialization and which method we use exactly with which fixed point we end up. Now an important uh, concept or result of our definition, however, is that once a patch is flipped, 
it stabilizes the second patch. So the second patch cannot flip anymore. And this effectively occurs because this patch, if it has his, if the lower patch is flipped, so if it has the marginals not aligned with the local potentials, then it is the same effect as if we would increase the local potentials in the upper patch. And this effect of increasing the local potentials now stabilizes our patch, and we end up with those solutions. So why do we do this anyway? Uh, the main reason is that we, that we have now few solutions. All of them are actually stable, so we can really obtain them and now evaluate the accuracy in a partition function approximation and in the marginals. And yeah, the question we're also trying to address, how can we, or do we have some measurement how we can quantify the quality? I mean, here we can still compute the exact solution using the junction tree algorithm. In general, we cannot use this. So if we are given a selection of possible solutions, which one should we use? And unfortunately, we don't have a good answer here. Yeah, if we would increase the coupling strength even more, we end up with some uh, pretty disordered solutions here. Actually, I just plotted two of them, although there are many. So let's take a closer look at the actual solution space. On the left-hand side, we can see the error in the marginals, and on the right-hand side, we can see the error in the partition function. We show the fixed point that minimizes the error in the partition function in blue, the one that minimizes the error in the marginals in red, and if it optimizes both quantities jointly, then we show it in green. Now, if we start with a small value of the coupling strength, we can see that at a global minimum of this beta free energy, we've got the optimum with respect to the marginals and with respect to the partition function. As we increase now this coupling strength, we can see that this fixed point still gives us the best approximation to the marginals, but suddenly we've got a second fixed point on the right-hand side uh, that now turns into the global minimum and gives us a better approximation of the partition function. So what this means is that we actually do still obtain, obviously, the best approximation to the partition function at the global minimum, but the best, the most accurate marginals are only to be found in a local minimum of this beta free energy, which is kind of problematic, one could say. So in general, we cannot rely on this assumption that the global minimum is optimal. And in fact, for these patch potential models, we could also derive some conditions under which this still holds. And for our specific example that we have here, we actually have equality, so the global minimum is optimal if two times square root n, which is the number of variables, basically this square root of n just comes from the number of variables sitting on the boundary edges times the coupling strength is smaller than theta n. Okay, so to wrap things a bit up, uh, basically we introduced these patch potential models with the aim of getting a model class that we can use to analyze the behavior of belief propagation. And we identified a well-behaved region in the solution space for which we could really analyze the properties. And this gave us, so I guess the main insight of this work is not really the global minimum of the beta free energy is not necessarily optimal with respect to the marginals. And this suggests that if we're interested in our marginals, we may or we should probably focus on some methods that try to give us accurate marginals and maybe not just put a focus on minimizing the beta free energy. Yeah, uh, thanks for attention. Do you have any questions? Feel free to ask me now. Thank you very much.